My name is William Claspie, and I'm the head of Special Collections and Archives here uh, at Case Western Reserve University's Kelvin Smith Library. As today's first speaker, and as one of the co-coordinators of this event, uh, I welcome you to KSL and to our conference, uh, to those of you here at the library, um, and to those of you participating via our live stream. Uh, I'd like to start by sharing a few notes on logistics for today's event. Uh, you heard a rundown of some of the, the speakers uh, that will be, all of the speakers who will be talking today. Um, each speaker will talk for approximately 20 minutes, um, and there will be 10 minutes allowed for uh, questions and comments. For those of you on the live stream, uh, please feel free to ask any questions or, or contribute any comments that you might have using the chat feature on the live stream page, and we will relay your question to the speaker. You'll see on the conference program that we have two speakers this morning, followed by a short break, uh, then two more speakers before we break for lunch. Following lunch, we'll reconvene for the final three speakers, followed by a panel discussion uh, with all of the speakers. During the breaks and before we reconvene after lunch, um, our library's copy of Mysterium Cosmographicum will be on display uh, for you to see if you're attending in person. Uh, we didn't bring a birthday cake for Kepler on his 450th birthday, but we do have a pretty good book here to share with you. Um, and uh, as Dean Ward reminded us all of the, uh, the concert tonight at the Maltz Center for Performing Arts, uh, featuring guest artist Bruce Dickey. Um, Bruce will also be speaking this morning. Um, and uh, this is really not a, a concert not to be missed. Um, and if you're in Cleveland, you, of course, can attend in person. It will also be streamed um, on the Maltz's live stream page. Um, I'll also point out that we have members of the Music Department's Historical Performance Practice Program uh, on hand today at the back of the room. Um, and uh, they have examples of Renaissance musical instruments, which they're excited to show you during our breaks today. Uh, please do visit them to learn more about these instruments uh, and the wonderful performers uh, that we have here on campus. Finally, on behalf of myself and co-coordinators Aviva Rothman from the History Department and Julie Andrzejewski of the Music Department, uh, we would like to extend our warmest thanks to our sponsors for making this event possible. Uh, the Kelvin Smith Library, the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities, and from the College of Arts and Sciences, the Department of Music, and the Department of History. <laughs> So why does a librarian go first? Um, I hope to give you some context about two things. Why our library came to own a copy of this 400-year-old book, and why we thought it would be a good idea to hold an event like this. I'll also spend some time exploring how a book like this was produced 400 years ago, not necessarily how Kepler came to write the book. I'll leave that to uh, some of the other scholars on today's program. Uh, but more mechanically, how, how was the physical item of the book produced? And why is it important for us to understand how it was produced and to understand the life this copy of the book has led for the past 400 years? Exploring these questions brings me great satisfaction, and it allows me to spend the next few minutes showing you how I might use a book like this in a classroom setting. So why Kepler at 450? Uh, Johannes Kepler makes something of a perfect topic for a group of people from a wide range uh, of fields to discuss. Very briefly, he was a school teacher, a mathematician, an astrologer, an astronomer who was interested in optics, geometry, theology, music, politics, many other things as well. His published works make him a central figure of the scientific revolution of the 17th century. These aspects of the great scientist make him just the kind of guy who would fit in here at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, students here at CWRU have a reputation for earning a minor degree in one or more field of study that may or may not relate to their major field of study. And this describes Kepler perfectly, so he would really fit in here. Also, CWRU has a long history of the study of all of these fields, uh, and for decades now has supported a program in the history of science and technology. Uh, and the Kelvin Smith Library and Special Collections has been an active supporter uh, of this academic pursuit. In 2016, 
the library purchased a copy of, lost my slide here. I'm going to keep talking about Copernicus here for a second. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. In 2016, the library purchased a copy of Nicholas Copernicus's De Revolutionibus, the mid-16th century cornerstone of science, which brought the concept of heliocentrism to modern thought. And there you see a, the, uh, an image of the title page of Copernicus, Copernicus's book. Uh, there. So that was in 2016. Uh, just a few years later, Aviva Rothman joined the faculty here at the university. Uh, and Rothman is an authority on Kepler, so we at the library began working with her uh, to, bring our, to build our collection of his works at our library. So when this copy of the second edition of Kepler's Mysterium Cosmographicum appeared on the market in early 2020, we jumped at the chance to add it to our collection. Since the book was published in 1621, after it arrived, I sort of half-jokingly suggested that perhaps we could throw a birthday party for it. Um, and uh, before I knew it, uh, Aviva had a plan outlined for uh, what has become today's event. Uh, also connecting to the fact that it's also the 450th anniversary of Kepler's birth. Double birthday party. So I want to talk a little bit about production of books, the production of books circa 1600. And this is how I teach classes that come to our reading room here at Special Collections. Their faculty teach them the importance of the work, where it fits within the scope of their class. And often, as in the case with this book, it's written in Latin, which many students, and even a few librarians, aren't able to read. So I focus on the, the material item what went into the production of the book, the labor, the labor involved in making the paper, in making the type, in the printing of the book, and in the afterlife of the thing of the book, of this copy. And that's what I'll do for you a little bit this morning. Um, in the early 1590s, Kepler is a teacher of mathematics, and he contacts his former professor, Michael Maestlin, uh, who you can see on the slide here at the center, uh, who is at the University of Tübingen. And he says that he has formed some ideas and he sends him a draft of his book. Maestlin immediately sees that Kepler's ideas are totally new and the two of them petition the university for permission to publish, um, which is a long and drawn out affair. Uh, but they, they get permission to publish and the printer, who is Grippenbach of Tübingen, he agrees to print the book but only if Kepler agrees to pay for 200 copies of the book himself at the, at the price of 10 kreutzer each, or about 34 guilders total. Now, this demand may sound familiar to academics in the humanities, <laughs> who even today have to come up with a subvention in order to have their book published, oftentimes. And to put the amount into context, at the time, Kepler was earning about 200 guilders per year. So it's a couple of months' salary um, in order to, to get his book printed. Eventually, he and Maislin raise the money, and the book is printed. How many more than 200 copies were printed? The record isn't really clear, um, but probably not a lot more. Um, this is, after all, a reasonably unknown scientist and his first book. Kepler did receive 30 guilders from the Duke of Württemberg for dedicating the large plate in the book to him. And you can see both the, de the dedication here and a painting of the Duke uh, here on the slide. So much as we are in the Kelvin Smith Library in the Friedman Center, um, uh, patronage was a thing. Having this many copies at hand meant that, Kep meant that Kepler and Maislin could send them all across Europe to other scientists, some of whom they knew and some of whom they did not know. Um, and this included both Tycho Brahe and Galileo Galilei, uh, both of whom uh, Kepler went on uh, later in life to have somewhat complicated relationships with. <clears throat> some 25 years later, 
The first edition had long been out of print. Kepler's many copies all distributed, presumably. And so he was encouraged by friends and scholars to produce a second edition of the book. Um, although he held to the main theses of his first book, many details had been expanded upon or a few thrown out uh, as he continued to study and publish during the intervening years. Theoretically, then, a whole new book would have to be written. Instead, Kepler had the printer simply reset the original text in type, and he added notes to each chapter, some voluminous, um, in which he could explicate and clarify specific points. What we have with the second edition, then, uh, is a unique view of the mature scientist reflecting back on his first work, his little book, as he called it, and responding to his younger self. While Kepler was not required to pay for the printing this time, uh, we do know that he received 300 guilders uh, for dedicating the publication to the Styrian Estates, which is where he was working, and his income at, at the time was approximately 3,000 guilders per year. So by 1621, Kepler was very well known, even famous scientist, and so the book could be produced a bit more lavishly as well. Um, and the printer and the book dealer at this time for this edition are Kempfer and Tom Tompach of Frankfurt. So one physical difference between the first and second editions of the book has to do with the format in which they were printed. And here we see on this slide um, a representation of a single sheet of paper on which the pages, uh, on which pages of, from the first edition are printed. Uh, the, the format in this case is quarto. That gives me a chance to pull out my stuff. I have, a, I have a very small facsimile of the quarto sheet here. In the quarto format, the printer sets the type of four pages to be printed on each side of the sheet of paper, laid out as we see here in the slide. Uh, once both sides of the, of the sheet of paper have been printed, the sheet is folded once and then twice, and the result is four leaves or eight pages of text. Books printed in this quarto format tend to have a more square re rather than rectangular shape to them. And it was a format fairly commonly used during the time period. It was an effective way to produce a reasonable size, not too large, not too small book, uh, with fairly efficient use of paper. And paper at the time uh, that was used to print books was the single most expensive commodity in the production of books. So it was a good, efficient way um, to, to print a book. Uh, the second edition, however, was reset in the folio format. What we see here is a representation of how the printer would lay out the type for one sheet of paper, again, uh, with two pages of text per side. And in this case, the printer would lay out eight pages of text to take up two sheets of paper. Um, and those of you here today um, will find facsimiles of these sheets of paper um, on your chair. I thought about putting them under your chair so we could have an Oprah moment, um, but I put them on the chair. So anyhow, um, you have a facsimile of those two sheets of paper um, that the printer would, would lay out uh, uh, eight pages uh, of text on. Uh, what we see here is the start of the B gathering. So each gathering of pages was given a, a letter. Um, and what we have here is the B gathering. You'll see the capital letter B just below that diagram on page 9. That's what that indicates. Um, so that first sheet of paper includes the first two and the last two pages of that eight-page gathering. The middle four pages would be printed on a second sheet of paper. Each of these sheets would be simply folded in half, as some of you have already done, but the rest of you can uh, try out now. This is like the easiest folding uh, exercise ever invented. Um, uh, so each of them are folded simply in half. Um, and uh, first, if you take the sheet that has B2 at the bottom, fold it so that B2 is facing out. Then take the sheet has, that has the diagram and the letter B at the bottom and fold that the same way so that the B and the fancy diagram is, is facing out. 
Now you'll insert the B2 pages inside the B pages, and you'll have your own copy of pages 9 through 16 of the second edition to take home with you. You'll see in there uh, a section of the author's notes in, as well, uh, so you can get a sense of the, the notes that Kepler made on, on the original text to practice your Latin. Books printed in this folio format are generally taller and more rectangular, and obviously use more sheets of paper for a given number of pages, and thus are often thought of as more luxurious. We've all heard of Shakespeare's first folio, for example. How about the production and reproduction of the plates that are in the book? There are several plates, um, and the one on the, on the slide now, and I have a reproduction of it as well up at the front. Uh, uh, so I want to talk about how the, the plate was produced and how it was then reproduced. Uh, for the first edition, the Tübingen artist Liebfried was hired to etch the plate representing Kepler's theory regarding planetary distances, which he, pa which he based on the five platonic solids nested inside each other. It sounds pretty complicated, and, and I'm hoping Professor Rothman will help us with that concept a little bit later. Um, but the etching of the plate is rather complicated as well. So the image that we have in front of us and the text would have been etched onto a metal plate in reverse, and that metal plate then would be used to print the image on a sheet of paper. And here on the slide, we have two images of this famous plate. On the left is an image of the plate from the first edition of 1596-1597. Um, and this is from the copy located in, in Dresden, Germany at the State Library of Saxony. Um, and on the right is an image of the plate from our copy of the second edition. So what are the visible differences between the two, and what do these differences tell us about how the plate was produced? Um, and in a class setting, I, this, is, this would be when I would um, awkward, awkwardly pause while the students try to think of something to say to me. Um, but I'll just point out some of the differences. Some of them are pretty obvious, even from the back there. Um, the most obvious is that they're mirror images of each other. Um, but some other differences that you might notice. Uh, one is uh, the apparent direction of the source of light. Uh, so, due to the shading, um, you can see that on this one, the light seems to be coming from, from, from that direction. On the other side, it ap appears to be coming from the other side. Um, if, if you can make out on the slide here that the paper seems to be a different color, there's different titling at the top. There's different words. They're different size. There's some smaller, maybe harder to make out differences when looking at this on a screen. Um, there's different instructions to the binder as to where to put this plate. Uh, there's differences in how the artist and the printer are credited. And there's differences in the style of cross-hatching that indicate the shaded areas as well. And even fainter to see, but maybe you can make it out, you can see some shadows of where um, the, the uh, paper has been folded so that the plate will fit inside the book. Um, and you'll see that those folds occur in different places um, on these two plates. Um, and that's to do with the difference between the quarto format and the folio format. So the one from the first edition had to be folded to fit inside the quarto. Um, the one from the 1621 edition is folded to fit inside the folio. But the mirror image and the difference in shading and writing tell us how this engraving was remade for the second edition. So the original plate, the original metal plate that was used to, to create the, uh, the etching was probably long gone after 25 years. So an engraver used the paper copy to trace out the shape of the, of, of the form um, on a new metal plate. Um, and then he engraved the writing and the shading um, to his own patterns and his own styles. Um, you'll also see that on the later edition, uh, the Duke of Württemberg's uh, dedication is left off. That 30 guilders is long spent. <laughs> I'd also like to talk about some specific traits of our library's copy of the second edition. As for a bibliographer like myself, looking at specific copies can tell us much about how this book was used. 
Um, this, the slide that we have here shows the outside of the book, um, the binding of the book, uh, which is very simple indeed. Um, and it's perhaps not, it perhaps does not date to 1621, uh, but it's certainly as it might have been issued. So it's, it looks very much like it would have looked if you bought this book from, a books, from the bookseller in Frankfurt in 1621. It's, and it's surprising to me um, that a, fi a fancy binding hasn't been added over the past 400 years. For, for a book uh, of this stature, typically an, an owner would put a very nice uh, full Morocco binding on it, um, but our copy does not have that, uh, which is actually, to me, kind of nice. I want to talk about the ownership of this copy of the book. Uh, and that's the, the study of provenance. Provenance is when we look at the record of ownership of a specific item. And we have at least some ability to know about previous owners of this copy. There are no markings in the book showing any ownership indications uh, earlier than 1920. Uh, so when the book was merely 300 years old. Um, there are pencil markings on the front fly leaf, which you can see on the slide here. Um, and the, these pencil markings give us two names and a date. We can see the names of Dr. Fichtner and Dr. Meltzer. And below it, Mexico City, 4th of August, 1920. Um, I did a little bit of research on these doctors and was able to find this guidebook um, on the other side of the, of the slide there. Um, a, a guidebook of Germany, a German guidebook of Mexico, excuse me, uh, published in 1921. Um, and this section of the guidebook on page 92 um, listed German doctors working in Mexico City um, at the time. And we can see both Dr. Fichtner's and Dr. Meltzer's names. So these were apparently two physicians working uh, in Mexico City around 1920. Now, why the book was there and why these uh, two doctors had this book um, is unknown, uh, but leaves a nice uh, detective story for someone to follow up on uh, in the future. Uh, the dealer from whom we uh, acquired the book did tell me that he acquired the book at an auction in Mexico some years ago. Um, so it sort of fits, uh, but it is still rather curious. Otherwise, the book has no marginalia, so no markings inside the book um, uh, other than uh, these pencil markings um, on, the, on, on the front flyleaf. Finally, uh, once the book arrived here at the Kelvin Smith Library, uh, we knew that we wanted to digitize this book, and that we have done. Uh, the book has been fully digitized, um, and it is available to look at online through our institutional repository digital case which has the very easy to remember URL, digital.case.edu. So if you want to see the full book, you can see it online there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to hear your comments and respond to your questions. <clears throat> Hi, Rachel. I wonder if you could use the microphone just for the live stream. Thank you. Sure. Um, so Rachel asked, um, what happens to the paper and the ink over the centuries? Um, and it's actually a fortunate thing um, for the survival of uh, books like this that uh, the paper produced at the time is a very sturdy uh, substance. Um, it's typically made from linen rag. Uh, rather than wood pulp uh, the way that modern paper is made. Um, and so it's very sturdy and sort of naturally acid free. So it tends to last very, very well. Um, it does age over time and different types of paper age in different ways. Um, the paper in this copy is in pretty good shape. There is some um, uh, 
uh, age spots uh, like some of us get at, at a certain age. Um, it does have some age spots, but it is relatively sturdy, um, as many books from 400 years ago are. I like to point out to students who come to the reading room um, that a book that's 400 years ago, I'm much more comfortable in, in many cases having students handle books from 400 years ago than I am having them handle books from 100 years ago. Um, so books from the late 19th and early 20th century are often much more fragile. Um, the ink you asked about as well, uh, printer's ink is, is quite stable and usually not much happens to it. Um, writing ink was a little bit different um, and oftentimes if somebody has written in a book, um, sometimes that ink um, can burn through a page because of the acidity um, from the materials that were used to make the ink. Um, not the case in this book, as I said, uh, there isn't any writing in this book, um, but that is something that we see from time to time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Chris, if you could use the microphone, please. Yeah, Bill, I was a little bit surprised by the plainness of the original binding. As you say, by the second edition, Kepler was more well known. I, you know, I'm used to modern splash blurbs and things like that, but to have it completely plain like that, was that common even for big authors? It, it, it was common. Uh, so uh, there was, um, in the production of books, there were um, the, the creation of the paper and the printed object um, was separated from the trade of the binding of that object. So oftentimes, the bookseller would sell it, just as you see here, in a very plain, they, they call it in wrappers. Um, and sometimes it was even plainer than this. Um, typically, what an owner would do then is pop next door to the bookbinder, who was right next, next door to the bookseller, um, and ask him to put that book into a uh, leather binding to match the rest of his books at home, or, or what have you. Um, or uh, you know, even, a, even a slightly sturdier cloth binding. Um, so yeah, it, but it is surprising that um, typically, um, even if the first owner hadn't done that, oftentimes somebody would have been very proud to own this book 200 years later and put it in a leather binding, but this one hasn't had that. Thanks. Yep. Hi, Chris. Hi, thank you. Um, who would have uh, been purchasing in a run of 200 copies? Is this going to institutions or individuals and <clears throat> what kind and so on? Thanks. Uh huh. So the, as I said, the first edition was a fairly small print run. Um, and it, from what I can tell, um, Kepler own, ended up owning most of them. Um, and so he, he honestly did just send them around. Um, the copy that ended up uh, with Galileo, um, uh, Galileo wasn't particularly well known, I don't think, in 1596, 1597. Um, so um, they didn't know each other. Um, but he did read it. It wasn't sent specifically to him, but there was a copy floating around Padua. Uh, uh, Galileo reads it and immediately writes off a letter uh, to Kepler uh, to tell him uh, that he really thought highly of, his, of the book. Um, so they were literally just distributed by uh, Kepler and his friends. The second edition, um, I didn't run across any uh, easily found information about the print run. I'm guessing it would have been bigger. Again, Kepler is famous at this point, um, and so more copies would have been produced. Um, the Kampach and, and the, the printer and the book dealer in Frankfurt that are listed on the title page um, are kind of big deals. So um, they would make sure that um, those copies would, would be sold um, as well. Phil. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how you could know this, but do you have any idea how, how many copies were marked up by readers? And that's typically the kind of um, work that's taken up by uh, scholars who do censuses of copies. Um, sort of most famously in this field, uh, Owen Gingerich of Harvard did the census of, of Copernicus's, uh, both the first and second edition. And in that bibliography, he lists marginalia, any differences, binding differences, all of those kinds of things. Um, to, to my knowledge, a bibliography uh, of that sort has not been done on this book, um, but that's the kind of work that typically would be done um, when somebody's looking at multiple copies over time. And what kind of testing would be done to determine that it's not a fraudulent copy? 
That's a great question, dear to the heart of many rare book librarians. Um, usually, um, they're not, well, they're, they're never invasive tests, uh, for one thing. Um, but there are, one thing that uh, a bibliographer's work allows us to do is to identify um, small differences between copies. Um, so in a bibliography of Kepler's work, uh, we may know that um, the third page of the B signature uh, didn't get a signature mark. Um, and so if I look at all of the copies and I see one that does, that sort of indicates that something might be wrong or that a word is spelled incorrectly, they caught it through the print run and corrected it. You know, those kinds of differences are the things that um, bibliographers look for and it makes it harder to uh, produce fraudulent copies. On certain books that are exceptionally valuable, people try it anyways. Um, so, and that's been known to be, to be done, obviously. Um, uh, and so what, 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 what we do as rare book librarians is our due diligence to, to look for all of those, uh, those clues. Thank you very much. And our next speaker um, is Aviva Rothman from the, the history department.